So we're going to switch gears a little bit in this next section talk about land records. When we're talking about high level initiatives, what do we need to support regarding land records? As properties evolve, as population grows, um, in my own community I'm seeing a local brewery, I'm seeing a restaurant scene pop up, old homes are being renovated. Land records is a process that rarely slows down. So how can we help support being a well-run, safe, resilient, sustainable community, right? Those high-level initiatives. So as our communities change, how can we support that at the GIS technical level? What are some ways that we can amplify GIS for land records? Well, let's talk about the parcel fabric. In Pro 2.4, the parcel fabric was introduced, bringing this aspect of our desktop software up to parity with ArcMap. So for those in the land records community, this legitimately is confetti falling from the sky. This is a big deal. And I'm going to show you a bit about how it works using the tax parcel polygons of Sheboygan County, Wisconsin, my old neighbor. Now I'm here and I see that there are some blue polygons with yellow boundaries. This represents Sheboygan County's po tax parcel polygons before being imported into the fabric. And starting at Pro 2.4, there are tasks that guide you step by step through either updating an ArcMap parcel fabric once you're using Pro, or starting with a new parcel fabric that you're creating for the first time. Often I find that my customers bring in a partner at this point to do some of the, the data uh, transformation that is needed. And sometimes using the task is all that they need. It just depends on those in your organization. So tasks can also be can created for your custom needs and then you can share them for other business workflows as well. And starting in Pro 2.5, you don't even have to navigate to your program files to import a task. Any that are available and installed along with the software, such as these parcel fabric administration tasks, will be available in the insert ribbon. So this is going to make my life a lot easier. I've already run the set up the information model task, and now I'm going to preview the load data into a parcel fabric task with you. So in this case, my input data sets would be the Sheboygan County tax parcel polygons. And these include not only the tax parcels themselves, but also the subdivisions and the condos and all of those unique parcel types. Um, they're trying to be accommodated with just this one table of polygons. I would be appending these into an empty target data set, so the empty feature class that I've created for the parcel fabric. And again, the field mapping is where things can get a bit complex. So after that step, you've, uh, you've done the most of the work at that step after the field mapping. Then it would be time to enable the topology on the parcel fabric and link to your camera system so that there are record fields coming from that other business system. And last but not least, you'd build the new polygons of the parcel fabric. So once this is all done, the result looks like this. Ooh, ah, <laughs> parcels, yes. <laughs> it's exciting, right? What's really exciting is what's happening behind the scenes. Absolutely, so we're still seeing a bunch of polygons, right? We're seeing labels, these are nice. We see the square footage of each polygon, but behind the scenes, there is a lot happening. And I'll show you that in the context of some record-driven editing workflows. So. Actually, let's zoom in to just a bit more. We're going to talk about these two parcels. Let's say I've just received a new deed that states these two parcels need to be merged. So this is a record-driven workflow, and I want any of my work done in the parcel fabric to be, uh, to be related to this legal record. So the name of the legal record is this, and it states I need to merge and the date is today, and so on and so forth. This would be the information I'm getting from the legal record itself. Once I create that record, we see up in the upper left of the map panel that it becomes active. So now all of the edits I do will be associated to it directly. So let's do that merge. I'm going to select the two that were stated. 
And here in my merge pane, I see the two features to merge and their uh, parcel numbers. Now the resulting parcel will have this number and it is uh, this parcel subtype, et cetera. I would enter all of the uh, metadata about the record change that I'm making and click merge. So we see that line in the middle drop away. We see the two parcels become one. And what's happening in the background is really, really important. So turning on the parcel fabric, I see in dark blue the number that matches the record, the legal document, that deed that was recorded. And I also see the transaction type so that I merged. And when I turn on the historic tax parcels, I see that the lineage was maintained. So this is important because I don't have to put in a notes field that is 200 characters of unstructured text. Parcel A and B used to be parcel C and D. So this lineage is all in the parcel fabric for you, and that's really useful. Now, let's say I had done not just one parcel edit, but a whole day's work uh, in a particular area which maybe is growing and changing frequently in my community. And I'm going to have a lot to do regarding the, uh, the text and the annotation on my map. So if I select all of the text parcel lines, I can update the COGO annotation with this tool rather than having to manually place all that text one by one. So let me show you how it works. When I click Update, just like that, they're all added to the map. And this is a huge time saver, especially in a community that is changing and trying to keep up with land records. Now, tax parcels are, are really interesting because there's not just one type. There's not just these friendly uh, polygons with one building. You also have polygons that represent subdivisions. You have parcels that represent condominiums. And you know that these types of data have different attributes. So what pertains to one may not pertain to the other. So the really great thing about doing parcel fabric in Pro rather than ArcMap is that you can use, you can create your own custom parcel types. And I'll show you that in the context of this condominium building. So what I'm looking at here, there's a green space that's maybe a general area outside the building. Then in tan, we're seeing residential areas, and then these blue areas are commercial. So I'll show you the plat for how this condo building uh, might look. It looks pretty typical, right? It looks like most plats I've seen before. But as I go page by page, I'm seeing something special and unique, and that is that it specifies both the level and the lower and upper elevation. So would my single family home in St. Louis contain these attributes, lower and upper elevation, in my tax parcel? No. But when the tax parcel is representing a condo, there are more custom attributes and fields that you can have included in your custom parcel type. And we'll see that here back in my rendering of this condo building in that plat. When I identify on one, I can see that indeed the lower and upper elevation values have been included as well as the floor number. And I can see all of the other um, examples that are available where I clicked. Now I can also enable range on this data because I do have all of these floors. And, and think of this as like, a stack of PDF plat maps printed off and stacked vertically on one another. That's what I have here in ArcGIS Pro. So turning on the range, I can start at floor one and step through floors and see how the availability of commercial and residential space differs on that particular floor. And what's more is I can extrude these lower and upper elevation values and put them in a 3D scene. So now I'm visualizing these plat maps quite literally in 3D and understanding the distribution of space in the building. And, and much like in 2D, I can enable the range. I could start at floor six and let's see, just view a subselection of lower floors and even combine it with a definition query so that I'm only viewing commercial space. So all of those same tools work in a 3D scene. And I can turn that range off and 
Note that I've even shown the air rights that extend above the building, so that's important to planning agencies, which we'll talk more about in the next demo. So even just changing the way that I'm symbolizing my commercial units, so right now they're in blue, but what if I symbolize them by their assessed value? This could be an excellent way for an assessor's office to gain a little insight into the distribution of value in this particular building. Nicole, did I hear you say insight? <laughs> I think I have an idea of a great way that we can help our assessor's department better identify patterns and outliers in their data, because otherwise, what are they working with? Spreadsheets and thousands of records. When you need to make better decisions based on information here, it's much more difficult. Can I give a try Honestly, on a technical demo? I would love a break. Yes, please do. OK. Well, Insight from Insights for ArcGIS, an immensely helpful tool for helping GIS people and non-GIS people find outliers and patterns in their data to better answer any questions that they have. I'm in my portal, and I'm going to open an Insights workbook that has already been created for me. And when it opens, you'll see some information listed on the left. It's coming from my sales and camera spreadsheets, as well as my authoritative parcel information. I also have some cards and maps on the right-hand side that have already been created. So today, I need to better understand the situation with my recent property sales and whether I have any foreclosures. I believe I have a lot of foreclosures, but I'm not quite understanding yet if there are any patterns on where or when they have occurred. In my first card, I have a simple map showing some dots for all of my property sales. The symbology is really not helpful, though, in helping me understand if there are any patterns. So I'm going to quickly switch to a heat map. Within a few clicks, I could better understand where there's a higher concentration of those property sales occurring. Well, let's get a better idea of the quality of those sales. And what I mean by that is there is a sales ratio metric. And in assessors and, and property land records world, a higher sales ratio can be indicative of a foreclosure. Sales ratio is measuring the value of a property compared to its sale price. If there's a higher property value, but it's sold really low, that's a high sales ratio. And if you sell it that low, that's where it can be indicative of a foreclosure. It's a really helpful, helpful metric to use. So I'm going to drag it onto a new chart, and I'm going to choose a box plot, because a box plot is a great option for highlighting statistically significant outliers or patterns. As you can see in my top whisker here, that means I have a large number of property sales with high sales ratios. Interesting. Let's take it a step further. So if I'm thinking this might be foreclosures, I know I do have a metric in my sales data with a location for foreclosed properties. So as I go through all of my helpful information here, I'm looking for that one metric for foreclosures to then map it and better understand where these property sales are occurring. Well, when you have such complex spreadsheets and you bring them into Insights, you get all of that complexity to work with. Exactly. So I do want to take a moment to mention, too, that the interaction here with Insights is meant to be easy for any user without even much training. It's drag and drop, it's browser-based, and it's really pretty easy. OK, so I'm seeing a bunch of dots on this map. They're all clustered. I can see some different colors here. Um, I need to better filter this. So back on my box plot card, I'm going to enable cross filters. And what that does is when I interact with my box plot to highlight just those areas with high sales ratios, you can see that it changes my other maps and cards. So really easy for me to then identify between the two maps what's going on for those particular filtered points. Well, lastly, so I've already understood what's going on, what are the property sales, where are property sales happening, are there foreclosures, and where are those happening, but what about when? We've talked a lot previously about temporal patterns because that is very important. I now want to look at the year and month of my property sales data and look at another chart, in this case, a heat chart, to identify any temporal patterns that may be occurring. 
Similar to other charts that you've seen before, the darker boxes indicate a higher number, in this case, property sales. Lighter color boxes indicate lower number of sales. And because I'm only interested in properties with a high sales ratio, I'm going to once again filter all of my cards. Within a few clicks, I'm able to see what I think might be a pattern that I'll need to dig into deeper. That in 2019, in the months of May, June, and July, I had a large number of property sales that seemed like they may be foreclosures. So as a local assessor, this is easier for me to make better sense of the information I have really quickly. But wait, I'm not done yet. All of those steps I just went through were tracked in a model. And this is key for any department. When you're working in a centralized system or a distributed staffing environment, maintaining a consistent methodology is important, and this is a great way to do so. Once you identify the steps in the process needed to arrive at decisions, you can create this workflow and then share it with the rest of your team to again um, ensure that consistency. That's really impressive, but overall in insights, what you've shown is really remarkable that someone who's gone from normally working in a spreadsheet has come into this browser-based environment and done so many different analyses just in a few minutes with some very easy clicking and dragging. That's a really great way to amplify land records and assessment workflows. And really, I would say it's transformational. We just went from spreadsheets to this in a matter of minutes. It really is that easy. And again, this is a tool that it doesn't have to be just for GIS people. It could be for many other people within your organization. Whew, so we just went through a lot regarding how we can amplify GIS in land records from maintaining data accuracy, streamlining those workflows, and identifying patterns and outliers in complex data. Here's a highlight of some of the technology that we use today. And in our effort to reach those high-level initiatives and be successful for land records, a sustainable, resilient environment and well-run, I think we've done some of that today. Thank you.